This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Get your free trial by following the link below. In the early 12th century, dark omens hung over the city of Aleppo. At the time, it was a vast powerhouse of a settlement, probably housing upwards of 100,000 people within its ancient walls and in the surrounding countryside. Ever since the initial Arab conquests 500 years earlier during the 7th century, most of the city's inhabitants had been Muslim. Yet just like the other cities of the East, it was also home to large and influential communities of Christians and Jews. Once one of the greatest cities in the world, by the 12th century, Aleppo was a war zone, a battleground between three vying factions, the original Arab inhabitants of the region, an incoming Seljuk Turk warrior elite who had risen to supremacy in the latter half of the 11th century, and most recently, yet another incoming warrior aristocracy in the form of European crusaders who had arrived in the region en masse just a handful of years before. These three warring factions also contended with innumerable smaller ones, be they Shiite rebels seizing the opportunity to go their own way, ancient Jewish and Christian populations, as well as Kurds, Armenians and Bedouin tribesmen. In short, the region was a melting pot of cultures, a crossroads of East and West, and a tinderbox just waiting to go off. Upon the death of the great Seljuk ruler Tutush in 1095, Aleppo had fallen into the hands of his son Ridwan, who almost immediately went to war with his brother Dukak in Tutush's other city, Damascus. Just two years later, when the warriors of the First Crusade arrived in the region, Ridwan still clung on to the city, though he now had to face off against the newcomers as well as his brother Dukak not to mention a whole host of other Turkic, Arabic and Armenian neighbours, all seeking to pursue their own ends. For the time being, as long as Ridwan lived, this tentative balance of power remained in place. In 1113, however, Ridwan died, and it wasn't long before his young son, Alp Arslan, named after one of the greatest of all sultans, was assassinated his throne usurped by his supposed protector, an unlikely rival power broker, though a ruthless player all the same. He was an Aleppan court eunuch named Lulu, who seized power for himself, prompting yet another period of intense political instability within the city. Faced not only with hostile Frankish invaders in the newly established Crusader states to the west, but also the fierce Artukid rulers of the Jazeera to the east, Lulu made the decision in the mid-1110s to call for aid. He sent for the one man in the Middle East who still had the potential to save his city. That man was the newly ascendant Seljuk Sultan, Muhammad, ruling way over in modern-day Iraq and Persia. Lulu offered Muhammad his city in exchange for protection against the Franks of Antioch and the plethora of Turkic factions now seeking to extend their control over Aleppo. Known as the Eye of Syria in its time, and for good reason, being the first stop to the region on the road from Mesopotamia, and thus the gateway to Syria and the Levant for armies heading out of Baghdad. Sensing an opportunity to re-establish the long-lapsed Seljuk authority in Syria and the Levant, and finally having cemented his own authority in Iraq and Persia against his many regional rivals, Muhammad gleefully accepted the invitation, choosing one of his foremost generals for the task. His name was Bursuk bin Bursuk, a brilliant rising star of the recent civil wars in the East, and currently the Lord of Hamadan in Iran. Legitimised and supported in his campaign by the Sultan, Bursuk moved quickly, 
amassing a vast army from his eastern heartlands. This already impressive army was then further complemented by tribal Turkmen warriors from the Jazeera en route to Syria. The vast Seljuk force made for Aleppo, its outriders ever eager for plunder and glory, its leaders likely seeking to portray the campaign as a great holy war against the infidel. Though in reality, it was just as much aimed at the rebellious Muslims of Syria. By 1115, Bursuk arrived outside the walls of Aleppo. Seeing the vast horde arrayed outside his city, and apparently now fearing for his life, Lulu suddenly decided that relinquishing control of the city would be far too dangerous. Instead, he did the complete opposite, sending word of his plight to the other Turkish warlords of the region. Foremost amongst these was Tegetkin, a former general under Dukak, who now held sway in Damascus, the other major city of Syria. And Ilgazi, the foremost leader amongst the Artikids, a Turkmen dynasty that had risen to prominence in Syria and northern Iraq since the death of Malik Shah in 1092. This call for aid by Aleppo placed both rulers in a precarious position. On the one hand, should Bursuk's army take Aleppo, it would surely only be a matter of time before the warlords of Syria lost their autonomy to the Sultan. On the other hand, rejecting the overtures of the Sultan, or even supporting his enemies, would not only mark Tagetkin and Ilgazi out as traitors, but also had the potential to do great harm to their already somewhat tarnished reputations. Eventually, after much deliberation, the potential gains of an alliance against the Sultan were seen to outweigh the risks, and much to the delight of the besieged Lulu in Aleppo, both Tagetkin and Ilgazi flew their banners for war, amassing their warriors to do battle on his behalf against the Sultan's army. Before long, as Turkish riders from all over Syria and northern Iraq began to amass behind the two veteran commanders, themselves fairly unlikely survivors of the maelstrom of the last three decades, they were joined by the unlikeliest of allies, perhaps the most feared opponents within the chaotic patchwork of sparring states that had become Syria and the Levant over the past two decades and more. The Knights of Antioch were going to war. Ever eager to stake their own claims to the neighbouring metropolis of Aleppo, the Knights of Antioch answered the city's call for aid, accompanied by the similarly impressive armies of Tripoli and Jerusalem, who like Ilgazi and Tagetkin, realised the importance of defeating the Sultan's army should they wish to remain in the region. Upon hearing the news, Bursuk was quite understandably enraged and shocked by the actions of his fellow Turkic generals, whom he had likely assumed would support him in his mission. He was even more horrified by news of the Crusader Turkic alliance. At the time, the Franks were still mostly undefeated, save the Battle of Haran in 1104, where the Edessan army had been soundly defeated, decimating the young county's offensive capabilities. The Knights of Antioch, however, still represented an experienced military machine, a powerhouse that struck terror into the hearts of their enemies. Again, Bursuk moved quickly, pulling out of the outskirts of Aleppo to successfully besiege Tagetkin's fortress town of Hama, before moving on to attack the town of Shizar, an Arabic stronghold that had by a combination of sheer luck and masterful diplomacy retained its own ruling dynasty in the region, despite being surrounded at first by Turkish and subsequently Frankish newcomers. Faced with yet another player on their doorstep in the form of the Seljuk Sultan, and a near impossible situation, the rulers of Shizar begrudgingly pledged their allegiance to Baghdad. Yet Bursuk and his men 
had little time to celebrate their gains, as word arrived of an impressive host of warriors riding up from the south. It was the combined forces of King Baldwin I of Jerusalem, Count Pons of Tripoli, Tegetkin of Damascus, and Ilgazi of the Artukids, marching side by side in alliance. Bursuk had to act decisively if he wished to triumph and salvage any hope of success from his campaign. If he acted quickly, he could still take the other major player of the region by storm, the one power close enough at hand for his massive army to defeat, the one power who because of its geographical position had not yet linked up with the other allies, and the one power in the region that the Sultan had consistently attempted to overcome over the past four years, the Principality of Antioch. Ringed by a series of strong border forts and manned by an amalgamation of Frankish knights, Armenian archers and Syriac foot soldiers, the Antiochene marches were a formidable bastion to come up against, though as always, even when combined with the forces of Edessa, Jerusalem and Tripoli, manpower remained a real issue for the Principality. Bursuk knew this well, throwing all of his cards on the table, abandoning Aleppo entirely and launching a full frontal assault on the position of the assembled Antiochene army, perched upon a parched hilltop at Atharib. Bursuk was a veteran commander, having made his name in service to the Sultan Muhammad in the brutal civil wars that nearly tore the eastern provinces apart in the early 1100s. At first, Bursuk and Muhammad had been a beleaguered and harried force, though, as the war against his half-brother Bakirak raged on and the tide began to turn in Muhammad's favour, Bursuk had been employed in putting down the last vestiges of resistance to the new all-powerful Seljuk Sultan, often seen as the last of the great Seljuk Sultans. Bursuk understood the strengths of his men well, expertly employing the Turkic style of horse archers that they had taken with them all the way from the wild steppes on the shores of the Aral Sea over the previous century, ultimately leading to their domination over much of the Islamic world. By attacking the Antiochene position, Bursuk had hoped to draw the Franks out of their camp and then surround and decimate them, like he had done with countless armies before. It was a textbook plan, and horribly outnumbering the men of Antioch as he did, he saw no reason why it should fail. Unfortunately for him, however, his opponent was also a veteran. A capable and fierce battlefield commander, a hardened veteran of the First Crusade and the subsequent consolidation wars of Antioch, he was Roger of Salerno, great-grandson of the famed Tancred de Hauteville, and one of the very last of the Norman Old Guard, who had followed the great Bohemund of Taranto from Italy all the way through Anatolia to the Holy Land. Upon the deaths of Bohemund, his nephew Tancred, and finally Roger's father Richard, Roger took the crown of the city by right of ability, and by his blood relation to Bohemund and Tancred, who had named him as his successor on his deathbed. Though technically ruling on behalf of Bohemund's infant son, Roger ruled as prince, even portraying himself as such in his coinage. Roger had held the line energetically for the last three years since Tancred's death, and now, horribly outnumbered and trapped upon a hilltop, he would attempt to hold the line again, being pitted in his first major battle as commander against a Turkic foe. Unlike Bursuk, who was facing a largely unfamiliar enemy, Roger knew the Turks and their tactics well, arraying his men in a tight defensive formation, similar to that used by Bohemund at the Battle of Dorylaeum in 1097, though with far less men to call upon, their situation looked bleak. As Bursuk's riders surrounded Roger's position, raining arrows down upon his men that blotted out the sky. Roger shouted for his men to hold the line, riding up and down the shield wall, sword unsheathed and raised into the air, screaming at his men to stay in position, 
threatening to take the eyes of any knight who broke formation in the search of glory. The relentless assault continued for hours, with moderate casualties mounting up on the grizzled Frankish side. Ultimately, however, with the allied Crusader Turkic army coming up from the south close at hand, Roger's heavily outnumbered force managed to hold the line, time and time again refusing to fall into Bursuk's trap. Before long, Bursuk ordered a complete tactical withdrawal to reassess his position. The day was lost. In physical terms, Bursuk had lost little more than arrows, though because of the defeat, disillusioned Turkmen warriors began to pull away from his army in order to plunder the countryside and return to their pastures between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Thinking the threat from the Sultan to have passed, the Allied army and Roger's men did likewise, dispersing to go back to their respective cities. But of course, Bursuk was not defeated, as beleaguered frontiersmen flocked to Roger's court to seek an audience with the prince, it increasingly became obvious that Bursuk's withdrawal had been little more than a ruse. A tactical retreat to give him the breathing room and time necessary for his enemies to split up once more and head back to their respective cities for the harvest. In September 1115, Bursuk's still large army wheeled back around to launch another full-scale assault against the marches of Antioch. This time, with no sign of Roger's army, they laid siege to the important castle town at Kafartab. The next piece in Antioch's defensive ring, which he couldn't afford to leave behind him. Yet Roger wasn't going to take this insult lying down. Not only was he one of the most famed warrior lords of the region, but he also had friends. Greatly benefiting from unstable political events in Asia Minor to the north, in the form of a war between the Turkish factions of Anatolia, the Danish men's on one side and the Sultanate of Rum on the other, taking pressure off his northern border for the time being, Roger was able to gain military support, not only from the neighbouring county of Edessa, but also from the neighbouring Armenian prince of Cilicia, Thoros, the Lord of the Mountains, who provided him with a contingent of fighting men, themselves veterans of the brutal guerrilla wars fought by Armenians in the Cilician highlands for decades. Roger was also likely supported by contingents of Turkopol mercenaries, Turkish and Syrian light cavalrymen turned swords for hire, who would support his own corps of heavily armoured knights. Upon hearing of Bursuk's sudden approach, Roger gathered all of the fighting men that he could muster and charged headlong towards the border. Meanwhile, having completed the conquest of Kafartab, the Sultan's army moved on to the next town in the defensive ring. Zardana, which they promptly began besieging, utilising expert tunnellers from Khorasan to begin bringing down the walls. Apparently completely unawares of his approach, Roger's scouts reported that not only did they have the element of surprise, but Bursuk's men were spread out on an open plain. It was exactly the moment that Roger had been waiting for, a chance to use his secret weapon in its optimum terrain. It was a chance to use his mounted knights. The tanks of the high medieval world. On the 14th of September, 1115, lances couched under their arms and split up into three columns. The Frankish heavy cavalry, likely not numbering more than a thousand or so warriors, launched themselves in a full frontal multi-pronged assault against Bursuk's position, breaking their lances on first contact and then drawing their swords to engage in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Where they had the advantage due to their heavy armour. Their impressive war horses known as Destriers, seeming like monstrous beasts to the Turks. They would bite and kick their enemies to death doing just as much as their riders to defeat the Turkish army. 
For centuries in Europe, large horses had been split off from their herds so they could be specifically trained for speed, strength and ferocity. The Turks, on the other hand, had reared their horses out on the open prairies of the steppe, never separating them from each other in such a way. They were intimately bonded with their horses and exceptionally skilled in their own style of warfare. In a straight fight, the heavily armoured knights of Europe always tended to triumph against their lightly armoured opponents. As the Antiochian assault smashed into Bursuk's army, he had no way to regroup his men. Within hours, amidst heavy casualties and confusion, they were pulling out to the east in a full-scale retreat. The Battle of Tel Danith was a major victory for the Franks, and in particular for Roger, who quite incredibly had achieved it all by himself, without needing Ilgarzi to get kin, Pons or Baldwin's assistance. Berserk himself only just managed to escape, climbing onto a hilltop with his bodyguard before mounting a horse to head back east to carry out the unenviable task of explaining himself to the Sultan. He died the next year a broken man. For the Franks, Tel Danith was a major victory. Their army returned to the walls of Antioch laden down with spoils and tales of war. The Turkish world was as divided as ever, with innumerable autonomous factions now going their own way in Syria and Anatolia. Though they ultimately didn't engage with Bursuk directly, Ilgazi and Togetkin had made it clear who they would side with should the Sultan attempt to reclaim Syria once more. Bursuk's campaign was the very last real attempt by the Seljuk Sultanate to retake Syria. From then on, the only real threat to the Crusader states, for the time being, would be the various Turkic emirs and warlords of the region. Yet Aleppo, the city that had started the conflict in the first place, remained in Muslim hands, with Lulu still pulling the strings of power. Roger's victory at Tel Danith marked the absolute high point of Antiochene power, a time when the Principality rivalled the Kingdom of Jerusalem for the position of foremost Frankish state in the Holy Land. Yet all this was about to change, and soon. This is the first in a two-part series on the aftermath of the First Crusade. If you like what you see, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can watch the second part when it's out. This video was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, a subscription on-demand video learning service with lectures from top professors all over the globe. You can access their library of over 10,000 lectures about any subject that interests you. The Great Courses is an incredible resource. I use it pretty much every day and I can't recommend it enough. If you're anything like me and you like to spend your time delving into the incredible story of our species, then what are you waiting for? Go to the Great Courses Plus forward slash history time or follow the link below. And what have you got to lose? It's a free trial. I've been spoilt for choice with this service, even as someone who has studied this stuff at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Without fail, I still find new insights and fascinating bits of information every time I listen to a lecture. Recently, I've been listening to seven or eight different courses. I like to dip in and out, but one in particular that I found fascinating is The Greatest Voyages of Exploration with Professor Lulevicius. From the Polynesians to the first Greek explorers of ancient times, to world ender monks braving the Atlantic on tiny seafaring Kuraks. It's full of the greatest feats of exploration in history. And of course, the history of the steppes with Kenneth Harl, because who doesn't love steppe nomads? Well, apart from Romans and maybe Chinese people. Thank you for taking the time to check out History Time. If you want to help me to make more and better content in the future, 
then please consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month by going to www.patreon.com forward slash historytimeuk.